Okay, the next item of business is a debate on motion 8948 in the name of Jenny Minto on uh, celebrating the success of the COVID-19 vaccination programme. I'd invite members wishing to participate in the debate to press the request to speak buttons uh, now or as soon as possible. And I call on Jenny Minto to speak to and move the motion. Minister, around 13 minutes, please. Presiding officer, I am delighted to open this afternoon's debate on the COVID-19 vaccination programme. The COVID-19 pandemic brought tragedy and isolation to many individuals and families across Scotland and the rest of the world. Many of us will have lost people we loved and been separated from friends and family. We must never forget that human cost. I'm sure we can all remember the early days, our sense of fear and nervousness, having seen the horrific news stories from China, Italy and Spain, and wondering, was this going to happen here too? The discovery of an effective vaccination felt very distant at that time. I'm sure too that many of us will remember that sense of relief when it was announced just seven months after the start of the clinical trials that UK regulators had granted authorisation to the use of the Pfizer-BioNTech um, COVID-19 vaccine. And before the end of 2020, the vaccination programme had begun in earnest. The development of that and other COVID-19 vaccines represented a remarkable achievement in scientific innovation and collaboration. The vaccines were developed using innovative approaches and were made possible by unprecedented collaboration between scientists, governments and the private sector. Their success in reducing the spread of the virus has been remarkable and they have provided a path out of the pandemic which is key to economic and social recovery. Much of what we are free to do now was impossible to do three years ago and the principal reason for this is the success of the vaccination programme but the discovery of a vaccine was just the start. Getting that vaccine into the arms of those at greatest risk of serious ill health and as early as possible was a Herculean task. Arguably the most logistically challenging national endeavor since the Second World War. So I want to pay tribute to all those who played their part in that, from those who scheduled the appointments to the drivers who delivered the vaccine to vaccination centers right across Scotland, to the vaccinators themselves, who included volunteers and members of the armed forces. And most of all, I'd like to thank all those people who came forward to be vaccinated. It is thanks to you that Scotland has consistently had higher uptake rates than other parts of the UK. More than 15 million vaccines have now been administered in Scotland, a truly staggering number. Of course. Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm very grateful indeed for the Minister for taking my intervention. I share uh, many of her points about the success of the vaccine programme. Uh, but does she recognise that many of the Scots that she's just paid tribute to were very frustrated in the early days of that programme? That for, while there was so much goodwill in helping it get into arms, there was unnecessary bureaucratic hurdles which slowed the vaccine rollout down in Scotland and a problem they did not have south of the border. Minister. I, I'm not sure I recognise that the point that um, Alec Cole Hamilton is making. I certainly know from my own communities the, 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 the strength of feeling and positiveness that the vaccination was being rolled out, as well as the continual information that was coming from the previous First Minister informing people of the whole process of how we were going to recover from COVID-19. Uh, no, I'd like to make some progress, please. Eleven days ago, we got the very welcome news that the same organisation no longer sees, um, that's the WHO, sees the COVID-19 pandemic as constituting a public health emergency of international concern. However, while no longer a public health emergency, we do still remain in a global pandemic that is a significant threat to health across the world. Vaccination, the tool that has brought us to this much improved position, is one of the most effective ways to ensure its continuing management. However, the road from vaccine discovery to where we are now has not always been smooth. The emergence of the Omicron variant in November 2021 and the need to respond to the advice of the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation to vaccinate everyone over the age of 18 and not just those over the age of 40, as had been previous advice. Literally overnight, health boards had to revise their scheduling plans to include far more people and to provide a vaccination opportunity to everyone before the end of 2021. You might remember the Boosted by the Bells campaign to encourage people to get vaccinated and the reopening of many mass vaccination clinics. 
In the period of the Omicron outbreak at the end of 2021, an incredible 1.45 million vaccinations were delivered in the space of one month. I acknowledge how difficult that time was for... I'd, I'd like to make progress. Um, I acknowledge how difficult that time was for health board staff, for vaccinators. Much was asked of them, but they responded fantastically, as they always do. And I would like to thank colleagues right across this chamber for their support for the vaccination effort. I'm sure I wasn't the only one of us who was photographed getting their injection to publicise the programme. There are, if I can just finish this point, I will give way. There are many subjects on which we disagree, but the need to protect those at greatest risk of serious ill health is not one of them. I give way. Stephen Kerr. Grateful to the Minister for giving way. She's made a very long list, quite rightly, of people who deserve appreciation and praise for their part in this astonishing achievement of the vaccine rollout. She has not mentioned the very important and strategic part that the United Kingdom government played in procuring these vaccines in the first place, making bold decisions early on to invest in these research projects, to bring together these collaborations that resulted in these vaccines. So would she now take the opportunity to express all of our appreciation to the United Kingdom government for making that happen? Minister, I can give you, I can give you time back for both those interventions. I'm, I'm going to suspend, suspend proceedings. Okay, broadcasting's back on. Minister, I'd ask you to resume. Um, there is quite a bit of time in hand, so I can give you the time back for that and the earlier interventions. Minister. Okay, thank you, Presiding Officer. And if I may turn to um, the, the people in the gallery first. Um, I understand the issues that some are um, experiencing, and my sympathy goes out to those that are affected. It's important, I think, that health boards take these issues seriously and support patients in their management and recovery of their systems symptoms. Um, and with regard to um, Stephen Kerr, I did actually recognise the importance of the collaboration between scientists, governments and um, communities within the opening remarks I made. So the landscape today looks better than it did then, certainly far better than it was in March 2020 when our lives were changed in many fundamental ways. But there remains a need for those at greatest risk of ill health to continue to take up the offer of vaccination against COVID-19. The spring COVID-19 booster programme began on the 27th of March and with care home vaccination, followed by appointments for those aged 75 and above beginning on the 11th of April and those with a weakened immune system aged five and over from April 24th. The latest data as of May 7 shows a national uptake of 85.4% for older adult care home residents and 51.3% for those aged 75 or above. Appointments for the spring booster are available in every health board and I would encourage those eligible who currently do not have an appointment scheduled to do so before the offer ends at the end of June. Um, if you don't mind, I would like to continue, please, thanks. After 30th June, healthy individuals aged 5 to 49 will no longer be eligible for any COVID-19 vaccination. We therefore would encourage anyone who's not completed their full primary care, sorry, course, that is a uh, first and second dose, to come forward to complete their course of vaccination while the opportunity exists. 
as both the spring booster and primary course offers draw to a close and the programme reduces to in a proportionate and safe response to the move away from public health emergency status, the number of vaccination clinics will reduce as we vaccinate smaller numbers of the population. So while those eligible for future vaccination will still be invited to attend their nearest clinic, it is very possible they will be offered different options to those previously. While this may impact on travel options, it is a consequence of the success of the vaccination programme and will allow staff to be deployed in other areas of the health support. However, we now have a more sophisticated appointment scheduling system that acknowledges that the closest vaccination centre, as the crow flies, might not actually be accessible. It might even be on a different island and will schedule accordingly. Earlier this year, the JCVI recommended that children aged six months to four years who have specific medical conditions which place them at greater risk from COVID-19 should be offered a COVID-19 vaccine. These appointments will begin from the 29th of May. Parents and carers of children in this category will be contacted by NHS Scotland with details of appointment in due course. And looking a little further ahead, we know that there will be a COVID-19 booster programme for the autumn winter 23-24, but await further details from the G JCVI on which groups will be invited for vaccination. Scenario planning with health boards to operationalise the final advice is already underway and given the success last winter of offering a flu vaccine at the same time as a COVID-19 booster to those eligible for both, I'm sure that that option will be being considered again for next winter. While overall vaccine uptake figures have been impressive, we also know that uptake across some groups and communities is lower than we would like it to be. Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, my officials have worked with health boards, third sector organisations and community groups to ensure the COVID-19 vaccine programme reaches every community and to understand practical and attitudinal barriers to vaccination. Generally speaking, the easier it is to access vaccination, the more likely people are to take up the offer of vaccination. We put in pra place practical solutions such as more accessible venues, provided funding for transport, put information materials into a huge number of accessible formats and languages and provided translator services. We provided quieter spaces and allowed more time for appointments, offered smaller clinics and appropriate staff training to support the needs of people with learning disabilities, autism, sensory impairments and mental health conditions. Health boards across Scotland are still building on the fantastic outreach work we saw during that, the, those first pandemic phases with partnerships across civic society to ensure everybody is able to access vaccination without any barriers. Clinics held in community venues such as mosques, gurdwaras and churches, are, as well as mobile units provided by the Scottish Ambulance Service, help people get their vaccines in trusted and convenient locations. The success of the vaccination programme has allowed governments here and elsewhere to ease... Yes, of course. Edward Moon. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to thank the Minister for giving way. One of the reasons why vaccinations worked so well in the Highlands was because GPs were allowed to deliver it, which went against the GP contracts. So my question is, Minister, will you commend the GPs for delivering vaccinations and will you support them doing so in the future if we ever have to face this pand a pandemic again? Minister. I, I thank the member for his intervention and given that I live on an island um, in, within the Highland Health Board, I, I recognise um, what, what uh, the, the point he is making. Um, however, I, I think that it is right for local health boards to look at decisions that are being made with them uh, in, in the round of the contract that heart health boards have with um, GP practices. Uh, yes, of course, Mr Ewing. Thank you. I, I'm most grateful to the Minister. Just following on that point, GPs in Nairn and my constituency are very much want to continue to provide vaccination services. There is a procedure to exempt them from the requirements of the GP's contract that this has taken away from them. Um, will the Minister and the Cabinet Secretary look again at this, uh, which would be a better solution for patients, for health, uh, and also be far, far cheaper and save millions of pounds to boot? Minister, I, again, I can give I the thank, time back. Right, I thank the Member for his intervention and note that the majority of GPs preferred the change in the way that the delivery of vaccinations was given. 
The success of the vaccination programme has allowed governments here and elsewhere to ease a whole range of restrictions that were introduced to halt the spread of infection and mitigate against its worst effects. International travel has largely resumed and we are now no longer required to wear face coverings in most settings or test for the virus. We have moved to a steady state model which can respond to an increased threat and while it's still possible to access a test in certain circumstances, we do not envisage a return to population-wide testing in our uh, contingency or variant planning. However, this position should not be misrepresented as complacency. The Scottish Government, in common with other governments across the UK and elsewhere, has always had in place plans to deal with health pandemics. The many lessons we have learned from the experience of the last three years have been applied. We continue to work with partners and key stakeholders, including Public Health Scotland, health boards and across the four nations to prepare Scotland to identify and respond to future infectious disease and pandemic threats. National preparedness arrangements includes stockpiles of clinical consumables, personal protective equipment, medicines, a contract for access to pandemic influenza vaccine and a national pandemic influenza service at four nation level to di distribute antivirals. Meanwhile, these staff who have been responsible for putting needles into arms and protecting us from the virus come from across the health workforce. One of the innovative approaches that was used was the de deployment of an extended vaccination workforce to deliver the COVID-19 and flu vaccination programmes. In Scotland, the vaccination workforce includes a significant of level three and four healthcare support workers who received specialist training to completely, to, sorry, to comp competently and safely deliver flu and COVID-19 vaccinations. These workers enabled us to deliver the vaccination programme at a huge scale and provided valuable training and development for healthcare support workers, improving their skill set and learning while working. I received my first vax on Isla, where there was almost a Cayley-like atmosphere in the vax centre at Bowmore Hospital. People who hadn't seen each other for a while, so it wasn't difficult to imagine the hubbub of chat and laughter that filled the centre. With the healthcare staff and volunteers providing the information and reassurance which was so necessary and so appreciated. We believe retaining the ability to deploy this workforce for vaccinations is not only a sensible use of resources, but a significant benefit to the public health protection system. Presiding officer, I would like to end with a thank you and a plea. The thank you is to every single person involved in the vaccination effort, including those who came forward to be vaccinated when they were invited. And, a plea, and the plea is to those who are invited to a COVID-19 booster in the future to come forward for that vaccination. Each of the vaccines available offer great protection against the virus, but that protection fades over time. It is important for that protection to be topped up if you are in any of the groups at greatest risks of serious ill health from the effects of COVID-19. And, presiding officer, I move the motion in my name. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. I now call on Sanders Golhani to speak to and move Amendment 8948.2 uh, around nine minutes. Dr Golhani. Over 17,000 Scots have died after contracting COVID-19, and I wish to offer my condolences to all those who have lost a loved one. And I hope our debate today doesn't stir painful memories. I understand that for many, it may bring little comfort when I say our COVID-19 vaccination programme has been a success. But the Scottish Government need to acknowledge that it has not succeeded in ensuring ethnic minorities take up the vaccine. In fact, we have areas of terrible uptake. But I can't praise enough all those who helped to deliver these life-saving vaccines. Dedicated health and social care workers, thousands of volunteers who stepped up, and of course, members of our British Armed Forces deployed to support a national rollout. Faced with a global pandemic, the sure way out of cycles of lockdown restrictions is via a vaccine, not the disastrous and frankly unworkable and highly ignored Scottish COVID passport scheme. That was a waste of time and money. And let's not forget the Scottish Government's advice to cut the bottom of doors off as well. The trouble is, normal process for vaccines take about 10 years. Imagine waiting 10 years, a decade, to get the vaccine. We'd be making decisions we absolutely wouldn't want to be making. Unprecedented cooperation, focus and funding. And this led to the development of multiple effective and safe COVID-19 vaccines in less than a year and created a blueprint for future vaccine development. It was extraordinary, this success, and a brilliant example of what we can achieve together. 
when we work together. The UK government moved fast and early on in the pandemic, supporting research, ordering millions of vaccines. The UK government was also criticised at the time, but it was clearly the correct decision. A vaccine task force by the UK government set in April 2020 and 367 million doses from seven vaccine developments with four different types of vaccines were procured. My alma mater, Imperial College London, in fact, were helping in the trials of COVID-19 and this was supported by £41 million of UK government funding. Margaret Keenan, a 90-year-old lady, was the first person in the UK to receive the COVID-19 jab. Uh, and she said she never considered not having the jab, but she did suffer one major side effect. She was unable to go home that night because TV crews were set up in front of her door. So we began the UK-wide rollout. In December 21, more than 10 million vaccine doses were administered in Scotland alone. Now, Edward Mountain and Fergus Ewing were correct in saying some specific GPs providing vaccines was the only way to reach lots of people. And quite frankly, the minister's response was confusing. Whilst it's okay that Central Belt uh, and the majority of GPs feel that the, the rollout and the way it was done was fine, exceptions must be made and GPs must put out the vaccine where appropriate. On that point? Yes. Martin Whitfield. I'm, I'm very grateful for the member giving way. Isn't it right that one solution does not fit all? And actually, we are at our best when we can use localised decision-making, localised delivery system to work for our individual communities. Sunday School, honey. I could not agree more, which is why in the Highland areas, centralisation doesn't work. In the Central Belt area, well, of course it does. There is a wealth of talent on these islands and there's a can-do attitude. And Scotland was one of the first countries in the world to begin vaccinating its population along with the other, four, the other three nations, the four nations in total of the United Kingdom, which benefited from our combined strength. Now, yes. Stephen Kerr. I hope that my friend Sandesh Golhani does not mind me saying to him that while we've uh, proposed an amendment in his name to the motion, we should welcome the fact that this SNP Scottish Government are actually embracing something of scientific value. Would it not be a good idea if their attitude to science was completely overhauled in this respect? Would it not be a good idea if they were less anti-science? Perhaps they could embrace gene editing. Perhaps they could embrace the benefits, environmental benefits, of clean energy sources like nuclear. Does he agree with me that being pro-science would be a good change of heart for this SNP Scottish I'm not, Government? I'm not sure the point is relevant to the debate, uh, Sandy School, honey, but I can give you the time back for the intervention. Thank you. Yes, I do agree. And in fact, if we looked at the Scottish Government saying that they wanted to, to do everything that Europe does, then we would be stuck without getting the vaccines quickly. My, my first speech here in Parliament on May the 27th was when I implored the Scottish Government to act and support people suffering from long COVID because not everybody in Scotland was fully protected by the vaccine and they still suffer today. People suffering from a complex mix of extreme fatigue, breathlessness, pain, heart failure, brain fog, mental health problems. I explained the bespoke setups in England. I even created a meeting with these, this bespoke setup with the Scottish Government. We need the Scottish Government to help, to care, to fund such clinics, but they haven't. The SNP Green Government published its long COVID strategy paper at a time in September 21 when 79,000 Scots were suffering from long COVID. And eight months of dither and delay later in April 22, £3 million was allocated to long COVID projects. By then, the number of long COVID sufferers had doubled. That was a year ago, and we still don't have long COVID pathways set up. In fact, I've heard of no Scottish Government commitment to roll out long COVID clinics. Frankly, it's an abject failure. Yes, I will. Jim Fairley. Thank you very much. Would the member can uh, remember the fact that when Hamza Yusuf was the, the Minister for Health, he actually said he had no objection to any local authority health board setting up a health, uh, long COVID clinic if that's what they chose to do. Sunday school, honey. We have a total failure of the Scottish Government looking after patients with long COVID. It doesn't matter if you say 
that there is money available. What matters is what you do. It matters about the implementation. It doesn't matter what the rhetoric is. It matters what you do. And you can see that when it looks at other things like the ferries. We need the Scottish Government to actually implement things that work. And that's maybe something the member can reflect upon. There is reality with 175,000 people now suffering from long COVID, and it's shameful. There is also a lot of shame when it comes to the stewardship of other things that the Scottish Government have direct responsibility into. The pan-UK COVID vaccine programme has been a success, with governments working together to get the job done. But in devolved areas like dental services, the story is very different. Instead of the Scottish Government patting themselves on the back, they should be looking at talking about the things that matter to the people of Scotland, like dental services. In fact, at the April's local dental association conference in Stirling, David McCall, chair of the Scottish Dental Practice Committee, underscored that the current statement of dental remuneration was unfit for purpose. He actually said that it's a barrier to patient care and the Scottish Government has done hee-haw to address this. These are the type of issues we should be discussing. A drill and fill model, not something that looks after patients. We also hear the Scottish Government trying to argue uh, about dentistry remuneration being swings and roundabouts. Well, that's something, quite frankly, that should be in a playground, not in a clinic. We have had a reduction in dentists that are working and the amount of output that they can do. In fact, Public Health Minister Jenny Minter was at the conference that I mentioned, uh, and she announced to delegates that NHS dentistry is recovering well from the pandemic, and we're seeing sustained recovery. As you may imagine, there was considerable scepticism in the room, to put it politely. And one dentist, Robert, responded, NHS dentistry is broken, and your party have broken it. I do hope that with current meetings with the dental representatives, that there emerges a model where dentists are able to provide preventative health care. As a GP, I do fully understand the importance of, of our dental care when it comes to our overall health. To conclude, presiding officer, while there is much to applaud regarding the development and delivery of our UK-wide COVID vaccination programme, we must avoid falling into the trap of making self-congratulatory statements while ignoring deeply uncomfortable truths about other key COVID-impacted issues, key devolved issues. With a new Cabinet Secretary for Health in place, we hope on these benches to see a marked improvement on performance compared to his predecessor. I wish to declare my interest as a practising NHS doctor and also move the motion in my name. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gulhani. Um, I just remind members, I, I do anticipate the debate will um, uh, tend to stray into other areas, but I would encourage members to stick as broadly as possible to the, uh, the text of the motion in their contributions. And with that, I call Carol Mochan to speak to and move Amendment uh, 8948.1, around seven minutes, Ms. Mochan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Before I begin, let me put on record my party's gratitude to everyone who played any role at all in the long and ongoing fight against COVID, and in particular those frontline health and care workers who risk their lives and the welfare of their families to keep as many of us as safe as possible. That, of course, includes those who worked on ending hours pushing through the vaccination programme that has successfully brought us to a point where we can proudly say today that we can begin to see an end to lives lost from this terrible disease. Those vaccinators and everyone involved in the significant effort that went along with it um, are really modern day heroes and we owe them um, to say so, so uh, as much as we can. I hope that in time Scotland will properly commemorate the thousands of people who risked as much to help us and also take into account that many of them still work in our NHS and social care sector, and that they currently feel that they are underpaid and undervalued by governments. Let's show true gratitude and address that disparity too over the course of this Parliament. But let me return to the wider fight against COVID-19. No one can doubt that governments across the world were wholly unprepared for a pandemic as far-reaching and lethal as COVID-19. But it is our responsibility to learn from that. 
and best prepare ourselves for the pandemics to come, as well as properly manage the continuing damage and potential threat posed by new COVID strains and long COVID. That preparation demands we are honest about the failures that happened too. Many people simply could not get a vaccination appointment anywhere near where they lived. We have heard of children being given the wrong dosage altogether. Of course the public expect in such an unprecedented event there will be errors, but it is clear many of the, these things were avoidable with better planning, and it is important that the government reflects on those matters. I am glad, Minister, that since that time there does seem to have been some effort to rectify, rectify some of the issues and look at some of the problems. But despite this, we are currently seeing a concerning number of over 75s failing to get their spring booster jab and a general lack of understanding among the population about where the vaccination programme will go next. Indeed, throughout the vaccination process, there were particular groups that had a much lower uptake of the vaccine than others. Properly understanding the economic, social and cultural reasons behind this is key to ensuring we get it right immediately in the future. But I must press the point that in order to address these issues for good, they have to be recognised as failings first, not swept under the, the carpet. We need to be honest about what happened and what is happening. On that point? Of course. Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful to the member giving way. And wouldn't she also agree with me that one of the deep sadnesses about the situation is that there doesn't appear to have been enough retrospective view of what happened during those early days of COVID, the early days of the vaccination, to drive what we do going forward. And that's a lost opportunity. Carl Mochen. Thank you. I thank my colleague for that intervention. And of course, that is absolutely part of the point that I'm making. We must not sweep things under the carpet and we must be honest. Perhaps larger than all of this, however, is the continuing failure to properly address the situation facing those suffering from long COVID. We believe there are as many as 172,000 people across Scotland suffering from this debilitating condition with a significant number simply unable to work because of it. Many of these people continue to report that they are victims of a postcode lottery for treatment and medication, a completely unacceptable situation for anyone in a country as wealthy as our own. We also know that this government has not matched support provided, to England, provided in England and Wales to those suffering from the condition, a fact that I find incredible and one that should be more widely known and spoken about. To avoid errors like this, we must properly process and understand the findings of the COVID inquiry when they arrive and not cower away um, when necessary action is required to be taken. We must address it. We must prepare for a future where this could plausibly happen again. In order to do that, my party is calling on the Scottish Government to meet with those suffering from long COVID and experts in the field to discuss the long-term funding needed to treat the condition and ensure the most vulnerable in society can access antiviral medications and prophylaxis. Long-term, our government must work cohesively with scientists, researchers, stakeholders and governments across the world to utilise the most up-to-date and cutting-edge discoveries in immunology, epidemiology and wider health care. Scotland should be at the forefront of this charge and with its world-leading academic institutions and pharmaceutical research, it can play that role decisively. We should not shy away to celebrate the success of industry and workers across the UK and Scotland when doing so. Investment, after all, is key to all of this. As we know, cooperation across the United Kingdom was exemplary during the pandemic and acted as a fine testament to what can be achieved when governments work together sensibly in the best interests of the many. I think for many people across Scotland, there was a great sense of solidarity and collective fortitude as the pandemic rolled out, knowing that families in Aberdeen and Southampton alike were going through this awful situation and sadly having first-hand experience of losing loved ones whilst fighting it together on a shared footing. 
I know that gave me strength during the pandemic. And if it ever happens again, I feel confident as United Kingdom, we are ready to tackle this once more, thinking of others across the nation. In conclusion, the development and delivery of vaccines were jewel in the crown of Scotland's efforts to fight COVID. We can only be thankful that so many hardworking and committed individuals took up the fight without fear and got the job done. I dread to think where we'd, we would have been without them. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Ms Mochan. And I call on Cole Hamilton uh, around six minutes. Mr Cole Hamilton. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I'm very grateful to, uh, for the opportunity to speak in this important debate. And I thank Jenny Minto for bringing it to the Chamber. I think I welcome her to her place. I'm not sure we've had an exchange like this before. Um, but, Presiding Officer, the COVID pandemic, as we've heard uh, several times this afternoon, was quite clearly the biggest challenge that we in this Chamber have faced collectively. But it also for those making decisions around the world. Overnight, the inconceivable became the everyday. In the face of an unknown and deadly disease, we were separated from our loved ones and confined to our homes. The virus claimed the lives of thousands of people in Scotland alone. They were our friends, family, loved ones. Most of us in this chamber will never begin to know how difficult it was to be on the very front line of this national emergency. And it was our healthcare workers who provided the life-saving services that held our country together. We owe them a debt we will never fully repay. It is right that we highlight and indeed celebrate the fact that the thousands of deaths may have been prevented thanks to the availability of COVID vaccines. But whilst we mark that achievement, we must also recognise that there were serious issues with the rollout in Scotland, not for political reasons, but for lessons learned, should we face, in the likely event that either we in this chamber or generations to follow us will face another pandemic. Those administering the vaccine were all too often let down by a lack of clarity coming from this government. Let us not forget that we had the slowest vaccine rollout of the four UK nations and that the Scottish Government was often slow and chaotic in its uh, approach to their dissemination, which led to delays in getting vaccines to those who needed them the most, which may have cost lives. I intervened on the Minister uh, to ask about the frustration felt by healthcare professionals. I uh, remember the GP in my constituency. Well, he, he lives in my constituency. He's a GP in Fife in a busy practice. Um, in a flu season, they can shift... 90 vaccines a day into arms of their patients uh, in any given flu season. But imagine their frustration then when they were told by the organising hub that they had a maximum of nine per day that they were allowed to administer the COVID-19 vaccine. There was no real reason for that. We had the stockpiles. And, and while in England, they trusted their GPs, knowing that they deal with flu seasons every year, to book halls and get those jabs into arms. There was a severe lack of transparency with little clarity about how many vaccines had been ordered, when they would be delivered and who would be vaccinated first. The government did not do enough to make vaccines accessible to those who were unable to get them through traditional channels, nor did they provide the necessary information to give the public full confidence of their safety. Turning instead to the counterproductive and illiberal shambles of the vaccine passports, um, which we needed Liberal Democrat op opposition to help see the backup. So while we would celebrate the breakthrough these vaccines represented and we should recognise the huge part they played in saving lives and getting us out of the crisis we found ourselves in, let's not pat ourselves on the back. Let's learn those lessons for the pandemics to come. Because you would be forgiven for thinking that Scottish ministers were the ones who discovered these drugs. The credit belongs to the scientists who worked day in and day out to deliver these treatments in record-breaking time. Part of the reason that the UK made such great strides with our AstraZeneca program um, was because of our world-class universities, the labs they host and the expertise they nurture, while, which highlights the danger of this government's £20 million cuts to their budgets this year and the warnings from the sector of a managed decline. Instead of hamstringing our universities, we should reward them with everything they need to carry out the necessary research to get ahead of the next pandemic. Scottish universities have to play a vital part in that. And as a, a, an internationalist, I believe that our efforts with vaccine research should benefit not just those on these shores, but people around the world. What happened to the promises of the richer countries helping to vaccinate the rest of the world. That was 
all too often lacking at the height of that pandemic. Going forward, our strategy must be to include those in need around the world, particularly in developing countries. We have the capacity to do so, if only we can find the will. The presiding officer, as Sandesh Gilhani and others have mentioned, um, let's acknowledge that COVID has not gone away. No one knows that more keenly than the 175,000 people in Scotland currently battling long COVID, many of whom are children. Scottish Liberal Democrats, with others, have consistently pressed for the Scottish Government to deliver some desperately needed support to those suffering from what is an often debilitating and life-changing condition. During his leadership bid, Hamza Yusuf said he would look to increase the spending for long COVID. Well, those are, who are suffering are watching and they are waiting. That threat still posed by long COVID is one reason we need to ensure that people, anyone who wants a vaccine, can get one as soon as they need it and wherever they are, to, and that those who are eligible are able to access a booster jab. Over the past few months, I've been contacted by many elderly constituents who are distressed because they are being asked to travel across the city to receive the dose they are eligible for. One constituent who is both physically and mentally fragile was asked to travel 10 miles rather than receive her dose at home, which she would usually do with the flu vaccine. While those caring for or living with vulnerable relatives are unable to get the vaccine when they ask for one because they do not fit the age profile. That's why Liberal Democrats want to see booster jabs available at accessible places such as pharmacies, as with the flu jab. We also want to see government learn from the experience of the pandemic and ensure that there is a dedicated vaccine workforce in place to help with future vaccination campaigns. We saw during the pandemic the clinical staff were taken away from other parts of the service to administer vaccine, which had a knock-on effect on waiting times and other services. A dedicated workforce such as that would help to ensure that we can respond uh, quickly and effectively to future emergency vaccination programmes. Finally, presiding officer, I'm aware of my time. As uncomfortable as it may be, it is vital that we acknowledge that we fell well short during the pandemic and listen to those who are feeling let down today. Those who failed to learn from the past are doomed to repeat it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cole Hamilton. We now move to the open debate. I call first uh, Jim Fairley to be followed by Brian Whittle around six minutes. Mr. Fairley. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. And I should say I'm speaking today from my personal capacity rather than that of the COVID-19 Recovery Committee uh, convener. And I'd like to welcome Jenny Minter to her uh, new role as the Minister and thank her for this debate in which the Parliament acknowledges so many people and organisations in Scotland that have contributed to the incredible effort in rolling out the COVID vaccination programme as mentioned by the Minister in her open, opening remarks. Now, we've all got personal memories of that time, and unfortunately for me, the event that sticks out was the passing of my mother. Instead of a normal funeral, we were restricted to very few who could attend the, the ceremony, and then we went home. Now, we all recognise that that lack of human opportunity to grieve together in the normal way and to share the most difficult of human experiences and the prolonged effects that such a loss has, and these moments are seared in all of our minds. However, we must also remember that we, why we accepted those sacrifices. It was the responsible decisions we collectively took in the difficult times to help the NHS, the Scottish Government, the Armed Forces personnel, local authority colleagues and the third sector partners to mobilise and roll out the vaccine. Furthermore, my constituency, Apertia South and Grenoche, are fantastic groups like Letham for All showed us the best by ensuring that the day-to-day -day support of people that were in need of any manner of supply and support was received by the efforts that they put in. So I give huge credit to these community heroes who didn't do it for profit and were motivated by making a difference to helping people when they needed it most. And I'm sure I've got colleagues right across the chamber who can think of similar examples in their constituencies. Now, our ability to get back to close as normal as possible is undoubtedly because the vaccine is saving lives and helping those infected to be less affected. Studies by Edinburgh University show us that the vaccines have reduced the likelihood of serious illness and death by 90% and compared with the unvaccinated population. Nevertheless, we still face challenges, not least of all by the comments made by people in the gallery today. And there is perhaps a question to be asked of how we ensure that vaccine fatigue does not happen for those who still need them. And conversely, how can people access a vaccine if they are, if they are unable to purchase one and are not in the eligible categories. People might want a booster for issues like travel or for their own peace of mind, and it must be available to them. 
and we must ensure that we maintain vaccine uptake and access to those who may require it. Now, my mind harks back to when I was growing up and hearing the famous quote of the then Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, whose brutal assessment was that there is no such thing as society. Well, if we haven't just witnessed the very best of society, I don't know what it is that we've just seen. And it's correct that we thank the long hours and effort from the Scottish Government, who steered us through the worst of the crisis. And I don't think anyone would have envied, envied the brutal round-the-clock burden that the former First Minister bore with such determination to do the absolute best to deliver a calm, reassuring message that the Scottish Government was doing everything it could to guide us through this crisis. She was there at a time when people needed to hear a reassuring message, and she did it in a way that reflected the mood and the moment. And I think we will forever, uh, that she will forever deserve huge credit for doing so. Conversely to that, the behaviour of Boris Johnson and certain members of his government helped give rise and was subsequently proven to be the continuing source of the public feeling, which is one rule for them and another for us. And it is with immense disappointment that I note the Tory amendment somehow implying that in Scotland we are uniquely the only country in the world who would not be able to navigate our way through a genuine international crisis without the guiding hand and paternity of a Westminster government, who I will give credit to for buying the vaccine up, but then whose behaviour undermined that messaging that was needed to hold the UK's collective responsibility together. What Scotland didn't need and doesn't need is a UK government to manage this for us. This is what a normal, independent country did right across the globe, and I dare say we will continue to tackle, we will continue to tackle this and other challenges in a way that reflects the needs of the people of Scotland. Yes, I'll give away Alex. Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm very grateful to Jim Fairley for giving way. I mean, he just told the Chamber that we don't need the UK government to manage this for us. Well, GPs in my community didn't need the Scottish government to manage their vaccine rollout either, but instead they got in the way and they slowed it down. What does he have to say to that? Jim Fairley. What I'd say is there are a lot of lessons to be learned right across the country, but to tell people that Scotland shouldn't be an independent country on the basis that we needed a vaccine is ridiculous. The Labour Amendment, however, has various issues in it, some of which I agree with, particularly the comments on the messaging around reaching those living in the minority ethnic groups, the most deprived areas, younger people and pregnant women. That should be an ongoing task of the Scottish Government to make sure that this vaccine and any vaccine is properly taken up. Now, we are all the way... I thank the member for taking that intervention and I am asking, does he agree with my colleague, uh, does the member agree with my colleague Doug, Dr Gohani, who said we have far more to do with coming to attack and uh, approach those areas with the minority communities to make sure we do get the same vaccine uptake as we saw in the wider parts of Scotland? Tim Fairley, I can give you the time back. Yes, I do, and I'll come to that point. We are all aware that tens of thousands of Scots are still suffering the effects of what is known as long COVID. And obviously this is a new phenomenon, so the research to get to the bottom of it is ongoing. Now, as a member of a, I was a member of the Long COVID Committee when we launched the inquiry into Long COVID, and I now convene that committee, so I will share with the Chamber that what we have included in our inquiry and reported to the Scottish Government. The report focused on three key themes, awareness and recognition, therapy and rehabilitation, and study and research. Now, we heard many harrowing things during our inquiry and learned about the complex nature of symptoms from those living with long COVID and from a range of health professionals and academics. The report makes several clear and considered recommendations, and I look forward to the response from the Scottish Government on that point. Thank you, Mr Fairley. I now call Brian Whittle to be followed by Christine Graham around six minutes. Mr Whittle. Hey, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I do appreciate the opportunity to speak in this debate at a time when the World Health Organization have just downgraded the COVID-19 virus. COVID has so dominated our lives over the last few years, I think it's difficult to recognize what life was before the pandemic. I also find it extraordinary to think about the lengths the public were prepared to go to to comply with COVID restrictions. Deputy Presiding Officer, at one point, we were only allowed out of our house for one hour a day to take some exercise. I still can't quite get my head around that. The only person I saw in a day was my youngest daughter when I picked her up and we went to do a little bit of running in the park for an hour. In fact, during COVID, I had my youngest grandson was born and he only lives 40 minutes from me and I, only, I, didn't, I didn't see him for the first six months of his life. But I also smile when I think through those dark times, how resilient we humans can be and how we always find a way. My old athletics buddies formed a Friday evening virtual pub night 
where we all got together online for an hour for a beer and a chat. And I always thought it was very interesting how the more we chatted, the better we used to be. The UK government produced a package of financial support that was unheard of that kept businesses afloat. So we had an economy to return to. And this place for once came together when called upon to support government's decisions. The four devolved nations put aside any con con um, constitutional differences for a while at least, recognising that a joint and unified approach in tackling COVID-19 would give us the best chance of protecting citizens across the United Kingdom. All the while, we listened to the talk of developing a vaccine. That was the only way out of this global emergency. We hoped and we prayed for that kind of uh, end to this nightmare. And I'll be honest, Deputy Presenting Officer, I was sceptical that we'd be able to develop a vaccine in the timescales being quoted. That was before we even looked at how we would produce it in the numbers required, distribute and administer it. I was not honestly preparing to either dig in for a while longer or even have to step back into some kind of normality with COVID still the major threat it was because of the lack of economic activity just could not be supported by the country any longer. Yet, as my colleague Dr. Sangdesh Gulhani so eloquently detailed, it took less than a year to develop and produce a safe and effective vaccine that was procured in the UK and distributed across the four nations at a pace that has never been seen before. Set that against the usual 10 years timescale that is the norm to develop, test and deploy a vaccine, and the scale of the achievement comes into sharp focus. Deputy Presiding Officer. Of course. Stephen Kerr. To Brian Whittle for giving way. The previous speaker, Mr Fairley, characterised the amendment in the name of Sandesh Kalhani as a somewhat, somewhat uh, strange perception he had, that it was saying that Scotland couldn't manage without the UK. In fact, it says it's, it's exactly what he's saying. He's saying it's because these two governments work together. The UK government did what it did, and the Scottish government and the Scottish people did what they did, that we had a successful rollout. Does he agree that really Jim Fairley lets himself down repeatedly by seeing every single issue that comes before this chamber as being a matter of constitutional politics when it clearly isn't. Brian, Brian Whittle and then give you the time back. Uh, thank you. Uh, can I thank my, my colleague for the intervention? I think he's right. It was the ability of our four devolved nations to pool our resources, to work collaboratively together, set aside the differences that enabled Scotland along with the rest of the United Kingdom, to have one of the most rapid and comprehensive vaccine programmes in the world. It did save thousands of lives across our small island and allowed our normality back into our lives much quicker than we can possibly have imagined. If there was, I just want, I'll just finish this point. If there was ever an example where the union is so important and unique to all countries in the UK, it must be the way in which we were able to tackle such a disaster together. And I'll give way to my colleague. Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful to Brian Whitt Whittle to give way, and I, I echo his sentiments about the, the four nations of the Union. Is it also, perhaps, to tread in slightly more dangerous grounds, a very good example of why politicians should perhaps listen to scientists in their input, particularly in matters that they are the experts in, and listen to the advice that's being given? Brian Whittle. I do think that we should listen to scientists, but it was quite interesting during the COVID that I think we were, we were evolving the science as we went along. And I think what politicians then did was retrospectively go back to what some scientists had said before and some of the actions that politicians took before and took big sticks and beat each other with it when we didn't recognise actually we were living in unprecedented times and science was evolving uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. However, uh, Deputy President Officer, if I could, COVID has not gone away as, as we live with it daily. What it has left us with are another set of issues, and I would like to touch upon a, a couple of them in the time I have remaining. I met with the Chief Executive of Ayrshire and Arran NHS again last Friday, and the issues we discussed have stuck with me, and I, and I wanted to raise a couple of them in the Chamber today. Firstly, the way in which we discuss our healthcare professions professionals is having an impact on retention and recruitment. We always and quite rightly hold them in such a high regard and recognise the incredible efforts they made during COVID. They were on the front line day in and day out under the most extreme pressures, keeping us safe. However, we then always seem to go on to talk about them as being underpaid and undervalued and burning out. It is little wonder that we have a retention and recruitment issue. About a decade ago, my daughter applied for a midwifery place at university. There were 44 places and over 400 applicants. 
Universities had a choice, and perhaps this would be a good time, Deputy Presiding Officer, to declare that interest in that my daughter does work in the neonatal unit in the Scottish NHS. But the Chief Executive of NHS Air Shanaan highlighted to me that for the first time they have had to go through the UCAS clearance process to fill places. On top of that, the dropout rate in these courses is appallingly high, as much as 60 per cent in some cases. So something is going very wrong with the Scottish Government retention and recruitment process, and that will need to be addressed. Perhaps speaking about them in terms of uh, being part of a caring solution instead of the massively negative way in which we seem to describe their role would be a start. This place has a responsibility, and thousands of places remain unfilled. Finally, uh, though, through my time in Health and Sport Committee and uh, last term in our work in the COVID Recovery Committee, there has always been a call for healthcare professionals to be trained up in this, con in this condition or that condition, like ME or Lyme disease or Hunting's disease. Most recently, it has been recognised in long COVID. However, co COVID ro robbed the medical professionals of CPD opportunities, which is yet to recover. That is crucial for the benefit of public health, but also for the training and retention of our healthcare professionals who for so long have had to focus on a single issue. We must work to reintroduce that crucial element of their role. As the Scottish Government are so fond of saying, there is still work to be done. Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr Whittle. I now call Christine Graham to be followed by Martin Whitfield. Around six minutes, Ms Graham. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. First, let me too add my condolences to those who lost family, friends and neighbours and recognise those still suffering from long COVID. For all of you, none of this is over. Indeed, COVID is still very much with us and a colleague whom I met at the weekend has just come down with it. I myself evaded COVID until late last year. I'd also put on record my thanks to all in the delivery of health services and in caring settings. We may not be clapping and rattling pot lids at 8 p.m. anymore, but I have not and never will forget the debt we as a society owe to you and to governments across the globe for joint efforts to combat this virus. I would also put on record the enormous commitment of the former First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, whose daily updates were valued by many, whether you supported her government or not. But, Presiding Officer, I must take Sandish Gulhani and others to task over, over what he presents as the purer-than-pure role of the UK government during COVID. What about Randox Laboratories, for example? Owen Patterson, MP, former Cabinet Minister, received £500,000 to advise Randox, which was strangely awarded a £137 million contract for COVID-19 testing without competition. This was later renewed despite having to recall 750,000 COVID tests because of COVID concerns. What of contracts issued for PPE to Tory pals on the VIP fast track list who had no experience of PPE and some 4 billion of unusable PPE bought in the first year which had to be incinerated? And who can forget Michel Moon? then elevated to the House of Lords, the scandal and that 100 million PPE contract, which even shocked Rishi Sunak. So let's put some context into the way the UK acted during COVID. Turning now to the vaccines, which have been our saviours. We were told that vaccines took at the very least, as others have said, a decade to develop and test for application. And that indeed was the case. And it took a global pandemic for governments together with the scientific community for COVID vaccines to be developed in that highly accelerated fashion. This shows it can be done and perhaps could be done in other areas of medicine when there's a will there is a way. It also underlined perhaps, as others have said, how much we should thank our scientific communities and that is not breaking news that they do collaborate in research. My son is a research scientist, though not in this field, and he collaborates internationally. So my gratitude to them. Now, being in the over 75 age group, I'm the beneficiary of the vaccine programme, having received my sixth COVID vaccination just yesterday. I would add that this time I also had the pneumococcal vaccine. My previous vaccines were accompanied with the shingles and flu vaccines. So I have arms like a colander. Only with the first vaccine did I have a reaction, and that was to shiver violently for some hours. But that was then a nonsense. So I say to others, especially in my age group and others who are not in it, who are frightened of the vaccine, 
please get vaccinated and, like me, if suitable for you, take the other vaccines on offer. Delivery, too, has much improved. In the early days, I found myself in a long queue with a two-hour delay in being taken. I left and came back on another date. Those days have changed, and yesterday I went straight through. I agree with the Minister that there is now more adaptability in what is a convenient place for a vaccination. However, I should say yesterday's vaccination was at Ocean Terminal, where signage was poor, and there was quite a long walk to the vaccination facility, which was fine for me, but for some with mobility issues, it proved a challenge. It became for me and others a bit of a mystery tour to locate the site. So perhaps the NHS could ensure that the authorities review signage and accessibility. To the future, I note that the World Health Organization has downgraded COVID so that it's no longer a global emergency. But I believe that some nations are working on an international protocol to prepare for perhaps an outbreak, let's hope not, but an outbreak in autumn and winter. Can I ask the Minister, given that health is a devolved issue, if the Scottish Government has been engaging with the UK Government along with the other UK nations regarding this protocol? Finally, for 12 weeks, when I was isolated at home, I wrote a COVID diary, partly as therapy, but also to remind me of what it was like for myself and for others and be grateful that somehow we collectively worked our way through it, which we did. One day, perhaps, my grandchildren might just find it interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Graham. I now call Martin Whitfield to be followed by John Mason around six minutes, Mr. Whitfield. I'm very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I also welcome the Minister to her place? And it is a pleasure to follow Christine Graham, even with her slight colander arms from the vaccinations that she's received. But I think her message about reaching out to people to have the vaccination, to have the other vaccinations that are available at this time is a very important one. And I think it's a responsibility both of government, of individuals here across this chamber, but indeed a commitment that our community should give to support those people um, to have the vaccinations ongoing. Um, of course, the COVID-19 vaccine was a game changer. And it has allowed us to return to a certain normality and to learn to live with this virus. And I, as others have done, thank all of those who were involved, far too many to single out, but every one of them, every single one of them is a hero. That army of vaccinators deserve our utmost thanks for getting the vaccine into millions of arms. And indeed, the manufacture, procurement and rollout of the COVID-19 vaccination is one of the great successes of our four nations working together. But let us be under no illusion. The rollout was far from perfect, from the countless stories of people having to travel miles for a vaccine appointment to the children who were given the wrong dosages. Lessons must be learned. And I do echo my intervention um, earlier that it is a shame that the lessons that should have been learned don't appear to have been done so going forward. And I talk in particular of the dynamic response that allowed our GPs to be involved, the fact that we should look to um, our pharmacies, and indeed we should perhaps look and be encouraged to trust areas to solve problems that work for their area, rather than trying to seek... More than Whittle. I'm very grateful for the member taking the intervention. I wonder if you'd agree with me that it is absolutely crucial that when we look back at how we responded to COVID and that investigation, that we're open and honest as we can possibly be and, and make sure there's no retribution there so that we can, be that, we can have that honesty. Martin Whitfield. I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful for that intervention. And Brian Whittle is right, because when the inquiry does start, and I urge it to start as soon as possible, when we look back, it cannot be an inquiry about retribution. It has to be an inquiry about learning. It has to be an inquiry that is a fitting tribute to those who sadly died during the COVID pandemic, to those who are still living with long COVID, and indeed those who are still feeling trapped in their houses because they're unable to come out because of their own immunosuppressant um, position that they find themselves in. But it is also right to say that we don't have to wait until that inquiry is completed complete to learn and implement some of the um, problems that we found and that 
uh, well, in one moment. And that includes reaching out to those groups who were low on the vaccination rates, who struggled to accept the vaccine. And that can happen now. I'm grateful to give away. John Mason. Yeah, I thank the member for giving way. I mean, would you accept that however many lessons we learn and however much we prepare, if you're going to vaccinate something like five million people several times, mistakes will happen. People will have to queue. Letters will go to the wrong address. Martin Whitfield, and I'll give you the time back for both um, interventions. Very grateful, Deputy Presiding. Yes, there is a reality of the rollout of anything, that there will be errors, there will be mistakes. However, we must learn from those so that they're not repeated time and time and time again. And I can think of a particular case um, very close to my own heart where a young person um, attended for a vaccination and was told he couldn't have the vaccination because he was supposed to have it at school. And that was contrary to the advice that he'd been given. Now, I think with the empowerment um, that I talk about in how the vaccination is delivered and indeed the empowerment of health professionals in an area, that actually that could have been overcome with relative ease. If, if, I will in a moment. If, if the individuals who were making those decisions had confidence that they would be supported in them because it was medically the right decision to make. Um, I'm not, I'll give way to Edward Mountain. Edward Mountain. Uh, thank you. Uh, I thank the member for giving way. I mean, one of the issues that came up in the Highlands, for example, is none of the services were included in the initial vaccination programme, so they were completely excluded. But does the member believe that the actual contact of local GPs with constituents or with their uh, patients that hadn't gone to vaccination centres achieved the 98% that we did get on the first vaccination pass and never managed to achieve again. Martin Whitfield. I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful for that and, and I think the member is, is both right and also understands my position that it's about empowering solutions that are community based, community focused to get the greatest success. I think not just with COVID but on so many matters the concept that a single solution can solve all of the problems everywhere has proved time and time again to be incorrect. And it is about empowering our communities, trusting our communities, and to go back um, to the previous, to trust those people who are taking the medical decisions um, for right. I do want to... <laughs> Stephen Kerr. Grateful to Martin Whitfield for being so generous with his time. But, but does he agree that the upshot of our experiences of the last couple of years should be that we move quickly to upgrade our health service from an analogue to a digital based system where all parts of the NHS are working together, speaking to each other, sharing information systems. I will be equally generous, Mr Whitfield. You can have all that time back. That, I'm, I'm very thankful to you, Deputy Presiding Officer, but I'm also thankful to the intervention because it talks about what the future needs. It talks about the sort of NHS that we need to have to support our communities and our people. And part of that has to be the digitalisation, the ability to transfer information. But as I was saying, I do want to just highlight um, some of the high-risk groups, because while life has returned to a new normal, this is not the case for the immunocompromised immu, um, immu, uh, or the 180,000 people who are still on the shielding list. There are still far too many patients who are living in fear and being deprived of transformative antiviral medication by this SNP government. And only a tiny fraction of those shielding are eligible for antiviral medication. And even then, getting access to the drugs is both a time and sometimes cost a real challenge. I talk, of course, of EvoShell, the pre-exposure prophylaxis treatment, meaning that it can be taken to prevent COVID-19 before the risk of acquiring infection. And I would like to hear from the Minister about what the government's intentions are with regard to these people who still find themselves trapped at home, who still frequently find themselves trapped alone, and are desperate to find a way of returning to the normality that some of us have referenced today, but one that they still cannot share with. And it would also be right to mention long COVID, which a number of speakers have done already, and the estimated 172,000 Scots that are living with long COVID. You know, concerns have been raised um, that this group have been forgotten, and we've heard that today. And I think we've heard it in questions, we've heard it in debates and statements, and it is the responsibility of the Scottish Government to look to the 172,000 Scots and start to offer them a map out of this. It is right that we celebrate the vaccine. All too often, medical science can feel like something we know sort of goes on behind the scenes, and we don't fully understand it, or dare I suggest, value it. 
But the COVID vaccine has changed that, and we need to remember that change of view. Science needs to be part of our thinking, part of our government. The role of our universities is crucially informed. But the last thing we want to do today is suggest that COVID is over, because it's not. Far from it. Health inequalities continue to persist across Scotland, and what we need to do is redouble our efforts to drive them down. I'm very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr Whitfield. I, I now call John Mason to be followed by Ben McPherson in around six minutes, uh, Mr Mason. Hey, thank you very much, and I'm certainly very happy to take part in today's debate, having been on the COVID committee before the 2021 elections and the COVID recovery committee since then. In fact, the previous committee was kept in place during the election period in case something new arose and needed to be dealt with urgently. When the COVID pandemic got going, many of us assumed that it would take a very long time to develop vaccines. So we owe a huge debt, as others have said, to the medics, the scientists and others who worked together so incredibly effectively to produce the vaccine so quickly. And just the other week at committee, as we considered preparedness for a future pandemic, we heard how the hope is that in future vaccines could be produced in 100 days, obviously with testing time on top of that. Now, the last figure I heard was that over 20 million lives had been saved worldwide by the vaccines, and I'm sure it will be much higher by now. And on top of that, many others were protected from serious illness. Now, it's hard to have this debate without considering some of the misinformation and disinformation that has been around both during the pandemic and continuing today. One such issue was around transmission and whether the vaccines would or would not prevent it. But I well remember Jason Leach speaking to the committee on this subject and making the very simple and straightforward point that if fewer people actually had COVID, then logically fewer people would be passing it on and fewer other people would be catching it. So it was true that vaccination reduced transmission. Now, there are always things we can look back on and might do differently if we had the chance again. But I think we should remember that both government and health services were having to make multiple decisions every single day. On the whole, I think the vaccination programme went well, but at the same time, we had constituents who were sent too far away to get their JAG, or did not get notification of it, or there were lengthy queues when they did turn up. One thing we did spend a fair bit of time on at committee was uptake of vaccines among different age groups and communities. Generally speaking, uptake amongst older people was very high, but reduced as we moved into the younger age groups. And also, it was lower in poorer areas. As of the 2nd of April, 90% of older adults in care homes had had their winter booster, whereas the figure for frontline health and social care workers was only 48%. Again, there are geographical dif differences, with NHS Orkney reporting 80% have received their booster, while in Greater Glasgow and Clyde, it is only 69%. Amongst uh, ethnic minority communities, fewer people took the JAGs, uh, and there have been various explanations given for this. For example, distrust of the government and the country of their background, from where some people would be getting their health information. I know that attempts were made to tackle this reticence, and both faith and other minority ethnic leaders came out strongly and encouraged their communities to go ahead and get their JAGs. Bemis also worked with ethnic minorities to promote uptake. And I, I do think that having one of the Glasgow centres as the central mosque was a good move and sent out a strong signal. Personally, I had one of my JAGs there. However, more negatively, there has been a lot of misinformation and disinformation spread on social media and elsewhere. Some of this was that COVID never existed at all, and others have exaggerated the level of vaccine injuries. I continue to see a fair amount of this, especially on Twitter. And sadly, some people do have a serious reaction to the vaccines, eh, perhaps because of underlying health conditions, and we must do all we can to support them. But the vast majority of people have a sore arm and perhaps flu-like symptoms for 24 hours and are completely fine after that. Just a couple of examples would be anaphylaxis after vac vaccination, which is rare at approximately five cases per one million doses, while myocarditis seems to have been at highest after two doses, with between 52 and 106 cases per million amongst younger males. But of course, these cases also vary in how serious they are. 
One of my own staff was taken to hospital by ambulance, but has been right as rain ever since. Going forward, we do want to encourage all those who are eligible to continue to take up the chance of boosters, possibly annually. Greater Glasgow and Clyde NHS are currently promoting sp the spring booster, which I understand is for those over 75 or with a weakened immune system. Teachers and other frontline workers had at one stage wanted to get the vaccines earlier because they were in contact with so many people every day. But the decision was made to focus very much on age, with the addition of particularly vulnerable groups. Obesity has long been considered a risk factor too, and I was interested to see Friday's Herald reporting in a study involving Aziz Sheikh of Edinburgh University on this topic. It seems that vaccines are less effective on overweight patients, for example, people with a BMI over, one, over 40, i.e. morbidly obese, who were 76% more likely to get severe symptoms. Another issue going forward is JCVI and their advice, which was given to all the nations of the UK, and we all tended to follow it faithfully. That had the advantage of consistency, including for the media, but it is maybe worth looking at next time round. For example, could you support obese people more to get the vaccines if that is desirable? Making vaccines available all around the world is another issue. I think there were some successes in this regard, and I know that both amongst leading politicians and professionals like Jason Leach, there was a strong commitment to international fairness. However, I think the sense did persist that the richer countries were grabbing what they needed first, while developing nations were allowed the leftovers. But overall, the vaccine, vaccination programme went better than many of us had expected. And once again, we should give our grateful thanks to those who developed, produced and distributed these marvellous JAGs. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Mason. And I call Ben McPherson to be followed by Sue Weber around six minutes. Mr McPherson. Thank you, President Officer. And I also welcome today's important debate. Uh, and we'd want to start, as colleagues have also, by expressing my condolences to all of those who uh, lost their lives and the loved ones left behind from the pandemic. And I think this debate is important uh, for a number of reasons, but initially to give us that opportunity to, to remember those uh, who were affected and also to recognise those affected by long COVID who continue to suffer and to reflect collectively on what more we can continue to do to support them. And I know that colleagues through different avenues in this parliament are, are looking uh, at those issues. My uh, first experience of a pandemic was in 2003, during the SARS pandemic, teaching conversational English in China. Uh, I'd hoped it was my last. Um, when the COVID-19 pandemic began in, in 2020, in the, the early months of the year, there was a sense um, of fear and anxiety about what this could become, but little did we know at the early stages and in the early weeks how quickly this situation would move. And of course, within a, a number of uh, days apart, things were moving so quickly and suddenly we were in a lockdown scenario. And at that point, I remember commentary from politicians and others of, would there be a vaccine? That was unclear. And then a combination of global collaboration, science and government administration, we got to a place by the end of 2020 where the first shots of this remarkable discovery were being undertaken uh, and we began the fight back against this awful disease. And here in Edinburgh, the way that NHS Lothian, of course, working with central government, UK government, uh, local government, the way that the administration of the vaccine was rolled out was imperfect, but also remarkable. And I want to pay tribute not just to all the volunteers and all the frontline staff that others have made reference to, but I think also the administrative staff that sometimes perhaps don't get as much praise and attention, but the organization, the <coughs> the way that those blue envelopes were cascaded out and fell through our letterboxes as a symbol of hope was such an important contribution to the national mission and the national achievement of administering these vaccines. As others have also expressed, I want to 
say thank you to those who took it and continue to urge those eligible to take their vaccine and to have their vaccine. We do also, as Martin Whitfield made reference to, need to bear in mind those who have had the vaccine but still feel vulnerable. Uh, and there are some important considerations and campaigns that are being undertaken at the moment to remind us of that uh, and to think carefully about how we support those individuals. To those who did not take the vaccine, I, I think John Mason rightly pointed out the challenges with regard to misinformation and social media, but also I would be interested in the government's view of how it's listening to those who didn't take the vaccine and as to why. The reasoning is, is, is often irrational to many of us who, who did, but I think we will do better to persuade them uh, in future scenarios if we understand uh, sometimes the, 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 the considerations that people gave uh, and to try and work through uh, to, to encourage them to, to take a position where they do take the vaccine because it was that collective uh, acceptance of the vaccine and, and enthusiasm for the vaccine that gained us the freedom uh, from the, the virus that we are, are enjoying now. Uh, of course, it's still around, uh, and that's why we need to continue to encourage people to take it. Uh, but of course, the, the scenario that we're in now compared with 2020 and 2021 is, is almost night and day. And one of the reasons that people um, struggled sometimes to take the vaccine has been expressed by others around geography. For example, here in Edinburgh, uh, in the initial phases, it was Western Edinburgh where people had to go to the, to the Royal Highland Centre to get their vaccines. Uh, I had two there. But in time, NHS Lothian managed to gain other venues. Um, and a very important one for my constituents, uh, the NHS Lothian and the Health and Social Care Partnership we managed to secure was Ocean Terminal. I take the fair criticism um, from uh, another member that uh, the signage might need some improving. But I can tell you that the creation of a vaccination centre in Ocean Terminal make a massive difference for my constituents in Edinburgh, Northern and Leith. Accessible by bus route, a tram route that's about to open there. And so I want to take this opportunity to, to ask the Minister to consider this going forward. That location has been excellent as a vaccination centre. My constituency is experiencing some of the most rapid population growth in the, in the whole of the country. The NRAC formula that funds NHS spending is not getting ahead of the population growth in Edinburgh. Ocean Terminal would be an excellent GP practice if we could obtain the capital and the resourcing for it to try and get ahead of the population growth in Edinburgh, Northern and Leith. So at the moment, I, I welcome it as a vaccination centre. I want to see it continue to, to deliver well for those who are getting their vaccines and encourage people to get their vaccines and to get them there if, if they're one of my constituents and that's where they're allocated to. But thereafter, I would really urge the government to seriously consider creating a GP practice in Ocean Terminal because it would make a, an important difference uh, for my constituents and uh, more widely uh, as we continue to provide health care for people in the times ahead. Thank you. And I call Sue Webber to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I am pleased uh, to have the chance to speak in this debate this afternoon to highlight the fantastic work the UK Government did to make the COVID-19 vaccination programme such a success. Thanks to the UK Government, we were one of the first nations in the world to be vaccinating people, and millions of Scots were vaccinated, protecting all of us from coronavirus. Meanwhile, Sturgeon was overseeing a stagnant and stuttering vaccine rollout until the UK Government intervened and sent the British Army and other military forces to assist the Scottish Government in vaccinating Scots. The COVID-19 vaccine programme was an unmitigated success in the end and a perfect example of what can be achieved when we work together. The success of the vaccination programme not only saved lives, but also con contributed to the gradual reopening of the economy, resumption of educational activities and the restoration of very much needed social interactions. This truly was the triple helix model of innovation in action as the vaccine task force compromising of academia, the universities, industry, let's not forget industry's involvement in this, and government, all work together to pace 
to work together to pace up and scale up a successful COVID vaccines and the vaccines that were identified by, at that point, it was Oxford University and Imperial College London. Yes, I will, Mr Kerr. Stephen Kerr. I'm thankful to Sue Weber for giving way. She's right, isn't she, about what she says about the fact that when we all work together and pool our resources, we get things done. Could we not also learn lessons then from the COVID experience in terms of how we tackle a persistent, long-standing issue such as malaria, where up to half a million children die every year? Uh, surely we could do something together to resolve that problem on the basis of the lessons learned from the COVID vaccine development that she's describing. Sue Weber. I am wondering if he's read my speech, so I might just hold on a little second and I will come to that very precise point. Uh, the COVID-19 vaccine manufacturing task force was key in supporting efforts to access UK supply chains too and get ready for the max vaccination effort that would be needed upon the identification of a suitable vaccine. And just to reinforce how successful this approach was, and it has been stated by others in the chamber today, the development of a vaccine takes 10 years on average from being discovered to being accessed by patients. However, while the UK government had success, we cannot ignore the mistakes of the SNP during COVID, which included that the SNP wanted to join the EU's vaccine scheme, which failed. The SNP U-turned on their vaccine passports and the, la the, the launch of the vaccine passport scheme was a disaster. And John Swinney was reported to the UK Statistics Authority for sharing a false COVID graphic on his Twitter account. The accelerated vac vaccination programmes from AstraZeneca and Oxford have had a positive impact on delivering life-saving vaccines for other diseases too, Mr Kerr. Here we go. For example, the new world changer malaria vaccine, which was invented at the Jenner Institute in the University of Oxford, marks a culmination of 30 years of malaria vaccine research at Oxford with the design and provision of a high efficacy vaccine that can be supplied at adequate scale to the countries who need it most. And Ghana has recently taken on this vaccine and is delivering it to its young children. Whilst we fully appreciate the value of the vaccine and the positive knock-on effects it has had, there are several issues within the health service that we would rather see the SNP government focus on. The issues that matter now, that cause distress and anxiety across the country now. Scots across the country are waiting far too long for mental health treatment, adults and children. Our children and young people, many of whom who suffered significantly from the unintended consequences of the response to the pandemic are still being failed by the SNP. Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services, CAMS, are the main route to assessment and treatment for children and young people seeking help with their mental health. Yet to this day, the SNP's CAMS target has never been met. In the first half of 2022, over 4,500 children were refused mental health treatment. And between January and June this year, 4,640 referrals to CAMS were rejected. So what support is there for these people? Social Work Scotland have said that these long delays in accessing treatment can lead to more entrenched difficulties by the time a young child or person is able to access a service. And drug deaths are another issue that we want to see this SNP government focus on. Because under the SNP, drug-related deaths have spiralled out of control and Scotland still has the highest drug death rate in Europe and it is 3.7 times higher than the UK. The SNP's current strategies to help those with struggling addiction have failed and are still failing. MAT standards are still not embedded. The target of April 22 has passed and those seeking treatment are still waiting. Anne-Marie from Favour says, you keep talking, we keep dying. This scandal is Scotland's national shame. Lives are being lost, families torn apart. The SNP government must finally start to listening to those frontline experts and back our right to recovery bill. After 16 years in government, the SNP seem quite out of ideas when it comes to tackling these issues head on. We need a fresh approach which incorporates modern, efficient and local solutions into healthcare. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you. And I call Fulton McGregor, the final speaker in the open debate. Hey, thank you, President Officer. Uh, on the 5th of May, the World Health Organisation declared an end to COVID as a global health emergency. 
Although this news was welcomed, I must stress that the WHO still considers COVID to be an ongoing global health issue. Nevertheless, it is the first time COVID status has been downgraded since January 30, 2020, which I think we all agree seems like a distant memory. Aside from members of our community who lived through the 40s, it is probably fair to say that it is collectively the biggest challenge many of us have faced in our lifetimes. And the global response to that was unparalleled. And for many countries, including here in Scotland, the approaches taken to react to the virus had never been seen before. The WHO reported over 750 million cases and just under 7 million deaths due to COVID. Your thoughts and condolences are with all those who have lost a loved one and indeed anyone who has been adversely affected by any aspect of the pandemic. Since those uncertain and frankly frightening times in early 2020, we have all seen the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccine, which has been the largest mass vaccination programme ever undertaken. Like so many times throughout humanity, humanity's history, great hardship has brought great scientific and technological advances. This debate is marked as celebrating the success of the COVID vaccination programme and how good it was. In looking up, in looking up the uptake, sorry, eh, over 4 million people living in Scotland have now received a first, second and booster dose of the vaccine as recommended. And even today, over 85 per cent of older care home residents in Scotland have received their spring 2023 booster, and this number grows week by week. And on that very point, this successful vaccination programme means many people previously considered at highest risk in Scotland are now far less likely to become seriously ill from COVID-19, as we have heard. Throughout the pandemic, the decisions to prioritise different cohorts for vaccinations was done in order to protect those who are most at risk of serious illness or worse. Decisions to prioritise one population group over another for the vaccination were not taken lightly, nor are they straightforward, and many in the Chamber will remember the debate that we had about police officers. And that is why the Scottish Government prioritisation decisions have been and will continue to be guided by the independent expert advice provided by the JCVI and senior clinicians. As with previous campaigns, vaccinations were offered and will continue to be offered first to frontline health and social care workers and those most vulnerable to the effects of the virus itself. We can celebrate the success of the vaccine programme while also acknowledging areas where we can improve, and I think other colleagues have spoke well about that. As it's the correct thing to do, an independent Scottish COVID-19 public inquiry was established to provide scrutiny of the handling of the whole pandemic and to learn lessons. And we must learn lessons in a whole range of areas. And that includes, presiding officer, um, as others have talked about and as we, we heard earlier from a demonstration from the, the public gallery, those who remain sceptical about vaccinations. I think we need to do more. And I, I heard the minister's uh, response to those who were in the gallery, which I think was very balanced and in the right tone. We need to well, I'll, I'll develop this point and then, then I'll let you in. We need to do more to work with and to appreciate and understand these concerns, understanding the albeit rare but recorded adverse effects, which I think people in the gallery were talking about, and impacts in various groups, including those who have previously had a reaction, and pregnant women, for example, because I think that sometimes in here, and likely within the scientific community, we might feel the evidence and advice is clear, but this may not always be the case out there. And if you take maybe in our population group, for example, children, uh, could, uh, are we a bit, have we got an understanding of what the benefits uh, against the risks were of children? Because there's a lot of concerns about that. Why were so many adults uh, willing to go and, uh, at the first opportunity, go and roll up their sleeves? But when it came to their children, there was a lot more talk about it, saying, well, should I, shouldn't I? I think we need to understand that, because if there is to be another pandemic, or if there's to be another variant of COVID, I think we need to have a fine understanding of where people are about um, with these questions, and also very big uh, thing on the misinformation that you find on the internet. Uh, John Mason talked about it. We need to find a real way to challenge that because uh, people are getting sucked in. There's no doubt about it. Brian Will. Brian Whittle. Okay, thank Fulton McGregor for taking your intervention. I would agree with me. It's not so much vaccine scepticism that we need to we need to look at. It's probably those few, uh, uh, that minority who have had a bad reaction to, uh, to the inoculation and the vaccine that we need to, we need to pay attention to and we need to understand why. I think it's that section of society rather than the sceptics that we need to look at. Fulton McGregor. Uh, yeah, I, th I think uh, Brian Powell has got a point there and I think as the MSPs will all have people come to our surgeries who um, ha have felt that they've had a, an adverse uh, effect from a vaccine. I think you know, we need to 
we need people that are medically qualified to understand uh, what is going on there and perhaps help to identify these people uh, so that they can be protected. Uh, I think others have, have made that case. But it, it's about bringing, I think, uh, groups that were represented in the gallery today on board, I think, as uh, Jim Fairley and others have said, and, and, and talking to them uh, and trying to understand uh, where we go uh, moving forward. Um, President Officer, although the World Health Organisation has declared an end to the global health emergency, we are still faced with a number of post-pandemic challenges, backlogs in numerous industries, economic fallout uh, and the like. But of course I want to speak, uh, as others have, about the uh, effects of long COVID. Uh, this chamber has often discussed the effects of long COVID and I welcome any measures that we can bring forward to uh, support people suffering from it. Um, the no Office of National Statistics have noted that maybe that just over 3 per cent of people across the UK are, uh, in Scotland are self-reporting long COVID symptoms, including uh, one of my constituents, uh, Jonathan McMullen, who has, uh, whose mum has contacted me several times uh, to uh, explain her uh, son's really de uh, debilitating uh, symptoms, actually. Um, so I had more to say on this, but I think others have covered it, President Officer. I can see I'm running out of time. But I just want to say that anything we can do to support people with long COVID, I fully support. And I'd really ask the Minister to take it seriously, because this uh, country and the world, actually, has shown how we can find a vaccine for COVID so quickly, an effective vaccine that has saved millions of lives. Potentially, surely now we can come together and find treatments or solutions for long COVID as well. And on that point, President Officer, I'm happy to leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. And we now move to winding up speeches. And I call on Michael Mara. Thank you, President Officer. And thank you on behalf of the Labour Party and in the spirit of the motion brought by the government to the volunteers, the healthcare workers, the armed forces and all of those involved uh, in the rollout of the COVID-19 uh, vaccines. It was a, a collective endeavour of community in this country, I think, that unknown, uh, certainly in my lifetime um, and in many uh, of our lifetimes. Um, but it's not just about a reaction about what happened in those uh, weeks and months as this approach was, was rolled out. Um, we have had the long-term extraordinary benefit of our university and pharmaceutical research communities in this country, without whom we would never have had the vaccines in the first place. Uh, and that feat of what I would say was urgent and quiet ingenuity will, I believe, in time come to be compared to the cracking of Enigma in the Second World War, and the scale of the scientific achievement that it represents. But the long-term roots of that achievement of mRNA technology are in open collaboration between scientists across the world um, and many of our most advanced uh, economies and communities. Um, and that was then scaled up by industry to a huge and unprecedented level, um, certainly. Sue Weber. Would the member also ex uh, accept that during that time it was absolutely uh, unique that access to data, clinical papers, and was all, were all given free so that the medical community across the world could share the information very, very quickly? Michael Mara. I, I think the member makes a very good point, and there is much that we can learn about the advances in scientific research practice that took place over those months in terms of open access to, to data, uh, the, the turbocharging of collaboration, um, but also the, the way that the, um, the scientific uh, testing and proving of those uh, vaccines were accelerated. And there's been calls, I think, from across the chamber in terms of replicating those forms of approaches to rapid um, uh, development of new vaccines for, for, other, um, uh, for other conditions. I think the point is very well made. But all of those scientific careers come back to outstanding public education and true discovery science that is beyond the risk of private enterprise. And so to celebrate that science, to treasure it, and to really champion it, means that you do have to fund it. You have to fund it. But in recent days, the head of University of Scotland has described this government's approach to universities as one of managed decline. And that should worry every single one of us when we talk about the subject that we're talking about today. In future years, will we genuinely be able to play our part? Will we? Not if we continue on the route of managed decline that has been condemning in this government. So we should not forget that lockdowns bought time for our scientists to bail out our governments. And I'm afraid I do not recognise 
part of Ben McPherson's uh, characterisation of the early days of the pandemic. I would say that the, um, the approach of this government, the, uh, the Scottish government and the UK government, was out of step with international be best practice and the evidence that was put in front of them. But they were in lockstep together. And it was only when communities came together in a, a spirit of collective self-sacrifice did we manage to contain the virus and give us time to turn the situation around. And people have met huge personal costs, huge personal costs as a result of that. Not just the loss of loved ones and their own health, but the wide-ranging impacts in our communities, on our economy, our public services, about the way people live our lives. And Brian Whittle touched on one of those issues. He was correct to identify the problem of recruitment of nursing students across the UK. There's also a problem in the recruitment of teaching students across the UK. Because people's attitudes to the kind of work they do, the, stra stra uh, the strains and the stresses that come with it, have changed as a result of the pandemic. And I would think that actually those, an examination of those workforce problems would be a good use of government time, both in this chamber and elsewhere, because it's a societal problem that is going to challenge us all in the coming months and, and years. And the Labour amendment, we've talked and it's been discussed by various members, the vaccine uptake being lower for certain groups. And I think everyone has touched on the need to make sure that we continue to learn the lessons of why that is. We also need to explore and invest in prevention. And this government has still done almost nothing on ventilation in schools. Almost nothing. It's about the Labour Party raising it time and again now for over the past two years. So the record in that area for the long term is very poor. But uptake among NHS and social care staff in winter 2022 was, in the published data, very low, with only 39% and 20% respectively taking the winter booster. So the Minister is right to highlight those issues and try to talk of the, 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 the importance of dealing with that. And I do think, though, in those the issues of transparency, presiding officer, Alex Cole Hamilton was right to highlight the issue of transparency when he was talking about vaccine hesitancy. We do have to build confidence in our public institutions. It is part of the daily work of politics. And people have touched, and Christine Graham did at some length, I think, identifying the litany of corruption that ran through the UK Conservative government from top to bottom, from the VIP lane to the ministerial lobbying scandals. And they have laid low the reputation of government and politics in this country. And frankly, it will only recover. It will only recover when that government is kicked out of office. But when will we learn the substantive lessons of the pandemic? Stephen Kerr made a very clear point on that, about the UK government making the right bet on procurement of vaccines. Correct in that regard. Many mistakes were made, but on that occasion, the UK government did get it right, and we were lucky that they did. On long COVID issues, Carol Mockin talked about and called on the government to meet the sufferers and to recognise their plight. And I listened to the debate between Sandesh Gilhani and Jim Fairley, but I think we have to recognise in the middle of that debate that the care is not taking place. People still are suffering. Whatever the reason for that and where the lack of uh, planning or the lack of money sits, people are suffering as a result. I, I don't have the time, I'm afraid, um, uh, the presiding officer indicating as such. So when, I would ask in closing, presiding officer, will the inquiry start? When will it start? How slow does government move when the threats of other pandemics are present, when they could come at the kind of speed that Ben McPherson talked about, where it can turn in a few months and we find ourselves back in those situations? Would the best tribute to the people that we've all thanked today not to be to announce the date for that, who will lead the inquiry? When will we begin to formally learn those lessons and change the way we prepare? so we can make sure that we do not have to deal with such grievous consequences again. Thank you. And I call on Murdo Fraser. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Well, this has been an opportunity to celebrate the success of the COVID-19 vaccination programme. And as we've heard during the debate, it was a considerable success. Scotland, as part of the United Kingdom, was a world leader in delivering the COVID-19 vaccine, protecting the population, and reducing the incidence of COVID. And there is no doubt that lives were saved as a result. And everybody in the debate this afternoon, I think, has agreed with that basic point about the success of the programme. And in, in that context, I do find it curious, as I think Sandesh Gulhani said at the very start of this debate, that we are spending the best part of two hours this afternoon debating this subject. This has not really been a debate. There's not been any points of disagreement between members here to any great extent. And there are many other serious issues in the NHS we could have spent 
this afternoon debating the crisis in primary care with a lack of GPs and surgeries closing across the country, the growing waiting times for cancer and other vital treatments, the crisis in child and adolescent mental health services, the crisis in NHS dentistry, which the COVID Recovery Committee will shortly be inquiring into, the long waits at A&E, ambulance response times, and the list goes on. And I rather think, presiding officer, our time would be better spent on those issues rather than patting ourselves on the back or looking at something in the past, which, welcome as it was, is not now going to change uh, as a result of this debate. But I'd like to address some of the issues that came up during uh, the uh, debate that were raised by different uh, members. And uh, Sue Webber, in her contribution, made a, an important point about the, the UK's decision to go alone and not join the EU vaccination programme. And Sue Webber reminded us that at the time the SNP were calling upon us to do just that. Uh, and Jim Fairley, in his contributions, seems to have forgotten that very important point. The former Constitution Secretary, Michael Russell, said it was idiotic to uh, not join the EU programme. He actually went further than that. He said lives would be lost as a result. The, the, the then Social Care Minister, Kevin Stewart, said it was, this is a direct quote, lunacy, and also, uh, again, a quote, irresponsible to do that. Now, Michael Russell is no, no longer here, but Kevin Stewart is still in ministerial office, and we've yet to hear any apology from him for that ridiculous scaremongering uh, that uh, came from a government minister. The reality is that the UK vaccination programme was a huge success, and we were amongst world leaders in delivering it. We saw the development of the Oxford uh, AstraZeneca vaccine, 100 million doses of which were ordered by the UK government. We quickly saw mass vaccination centres open. An enormous logistical exercise had to be put into place really quickly, and it worked extremely well. And yes, I agree with John Mason. There were, on occasion, uh, errors, and we, we, I'm sure we heard those from our constituents, but that should not take away from the overall picture of a great success. And I agree with Ben McPherson's comment that we should pay tribute to those behind the scenes who were working very hard to administer this. But we also had many in the front line. We had thousands of volunteers who came forward, who, who were prepared to staff up the vaccination centres and give up their free time to help others. And we should also acknowledge the input of the UK Armed Forces, stepping in to assist the NHS and provide vaccination support in locations across the country. There were issues that uh, uh, came up. Sandra, uh, Sanders Kohani mentioned the question of GPs being allowed to deliver the vaccine. Uh, like Alex Cole Hamilton, I think there were a number of areas of the country where if GPs had been allowed to deliver the vaccine, that would have avoided some of the difficulties people had, particularly in rural areas, of having to travel large uh, uh, distances. And we saw the problem, as Carol Mockin referenced, of long COVID. Lots of promises we made about helping long COVID sufferers, but as the COVID Recovery Committee heard during our recent inquiry, too many of them still feel badly let down. And one of the saddest things we heard as a committee from long COVID sufferers was about the difficulty uh, they had when they went to their GPs. Their GPs were not well informed in too many cases uh, of the symptoms of long COVID. And in some cases, these individuals had no alternative but to pay privately to see a GP with some expertise. And that's an area where I think the Scottish Government need to do much more. Now, the vaccination programme continues. I myself was vaccinated back in autumn, uh, now being in the group of over 50s, and I know the take-up of that offer was high. And we need to consider in future whether vaccinations will be offered for the coming winter season, perhaps in combination with the flu vaccine. And it's encouraging that people still recognise the value of the vaccination and are willing to participate. But there are still issues. There are issues with the ethnic minority groups not picking up uh, the, the vaccination uh, as a number of members referred to in the debate, partic particular groups, the Afro-Caribbean community, uh, the Polish community seem to have a particular issue with access to vaccinations. And I think there's a lot of work government needs to do to reinforce to different groups uh, the, the uh, absolute uh, essential uh, necessity of having uh, the vaccination. I certainly don't think we should pay much attention to the anti-vax brigade, but we should recognise that people have legitimate concerns about the side effects of some of the vaccines. And Brian Whittle made this point earlier. And I do think this is an area where there needs to be a proper investigation. I hope that the 
COVID-19 inquiry, when it gets going properly, will actually spend some time hearing evidence from individuals who have been affected by vaccines and been affected by side effects. I look into this whole question. There has been some evidence, and this is well recorded, that the AstraZeneca vaccine may have caused blood clotting in a tiny minority of individuals. So I think it's really important to retain confidence in the vaccination programme, that where individuals do have concerns around a particular vaccine, they are offered an alternative. And it's an issue I raised recently on behalf of a constituent with NHS Fife. And I hope that NHS boards across Scotland will be prepared to be flexible so where people have legitimate concerns about potential side effects of a vaccine, they will be given an alternative vaccine instead of the one they have concerns about. But just to close, presiding officer, even with the small minority of patients demonstrating side effects, the reality is that the overall benefits of the vaccination programme by far outweighed uh, the risks. The vaccination programme allowed the country to get back on its feet much quicker than might otherwise have been the case. It's been a real success story, both for Scotland and for the whole United Kingdom, and we should congratulate all those who were involved in delivering it. Thank you. Thank you. And I call on Jenny Minto to wind up to nine minutes, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and thank you to all members for contributing to what I think was a, a very helpful, reflective and constructive debate. I think when we have a Scottish success story, then it is only appropriate to acknowledge these in this chamber, and I'm grateful to everybody who has taken part. And yes, there are always lessons that can be learned, but one of the reasons our vaccination programme has been successful is because it has learned lessons at every stage and adapted accordingly. This programme was built from scratch three years ago, and nobody should underestimate the size of that achievement and that Scotland has consistently the highest uptake in the UK. I also think it's worth um, reflecting on the digital response. The success of our vaccination programme was as much to do with our investment in digital capabilities as it was to do with our people. It would not have been possible for us to achieve what we did without robust digital planning. And thanks to our national vaccine scheduling system, we offered for the first time at national scale true choice and flexibility for people in deciding where and when they were vaccinated. But I do note um, Christine Graham's point about signage. It is an example of a service built around, chill, uh, built around people, as Fulton McGregor has said. However, um, in relation to Alec Cole Hamilton's point, I am extremely sorry to hear um, what your constituent experienced. And if I can be of any help, then please um, provide me with the details. Um, for the first time, we offered the people in Scotland access to their COVID vaccination record through the COVID status certification. Uh, and we are committed to extending this service for health records more broadly, as Stephen Kerr intervened on. As, as, as others have said, the success of this programme is measured first and foremost by the lives saved, but also by the freedoms, social and economic, returned to us when restrictions were eased as the effectiveness of the vaccination took hold. Um, and this week I was home on Isla and I passed by the co-op. Now, during lockdown, I shopped for a number of people and as a result, I knew um, what was on every shelf and my shopping lists were done in the sequence of the very clear one-way system. As lockdown began to be lifted, um, one of the ladies, or I should say eased, one of the ladies I shopped for asked if I would take her to the co. And we had our masks on. And we made our way around the shop following the one-way route and keeping two metres apart. I could sense she was apprehensive, which touches on the point that Martin Whitfield was making. But all the protocols that were in place helped her. I know she enjoyed the freedom of choosing her meals based on what was on the shelves and not what was on her list that she gave to me. I think it is these small things that we took for granted prior to COVID that we cherish even now. But also, as Jim Fairley and also Brian Whittle referenced, the important uh, family times, um, the, the impact of the lockdown really impacted upon, and the ability not to come together as family and friends at these, these family times. I think we need to acknowledge that as well. In my opening remarks, um, with regards to the uptake of the vaccination, while impressively high overall and consistently above uptake rates in the other UK nations, this was not uniform all across all groups, and this has been highlighted by the vast majority of speakers um, today. 
Of course, uh, over the course of the programme, relationships with key community leaders representing different groups have been fostered, developed and strengthened, meaning that information about vaccines is presented in a way that is more likely to encourage them to take up the offer of vaccination and offered to them in an environment in which they feel comfortable. It's always helpful to hear individual experiences of the vaccination programme, and I'm sure I'm not the only one who attended their very first COVID vaccination with a mixture of trepidation, but also excitement. Knowing the prize on offer, a return to something resembling normal life, meant that there was never any question of me not turning up to be vaccinated then and for every subsequent JAG. But I am aware that for a number of reasons, some people choose not to come forward and that for some people who did come forward, the experience wasn't as smooth as they and I would have wanted. While such experiences were not the norm, I, would, I know that such individual experiences led to improvements at every stage of the process, from invitation to vaccination and to the vaccination itself. And I would reference again the remarks I made in uh, my opening speech with regard to people that have been perhaps impacted um, negatively by, by the vaccination. And I think there is a, a need um, to listen there. Of course. I am very grateful to the Minister for, for giving way. I wonder, in relation to the point I, I made a moment ago, around individuals who have perhaps had negative side effects from a particular vaccine and do not want to repeat that, would you agree with me that NHS boards should be offering an alternative vaccine to people in those circumstances? Minister. Uh, I thank uh, Marjorie Fraser for that intervention. Um, I, I, I do not feel um, uh, clinically aware enough to be able to answer that question, but I think there, there is, a, is a, a requirement to really look at the, the impacts that people have received from vaccinations. Um, in conclusion, I would like to repeat my heartfelt thanks to all those involved in the vaccination effort at every stage. Yes, of course. Ivan McKee. Uh, I just wonder if the Minister would uh, care to join me in uh, recognising the work of Scotland's uh, very strong life science sector and the dozens of Scottish companies that uh, contributed to the vaccine manufacture, supply chain and test supply chain, not just here, but contributing to the fight against COVID globally? Minister. I would like to. Um, I, I would agree with uh, my colleague Ivan McKee with regards to the importance of the Scottish supply chain and life sciences industries, um, and also the support that um, Scottish companies gave with regard to PPE as well. So very important. In conclusion, I'd like to repeat my heartfelt thanks to all those involved in the vaccination effort at every stage of the process. Uh, in many ways, the flu vaccine, COVID vac vaccination programme was an example of how vital but hugely complex projects should be run. It was no accident that it won the best programme award at last year's Holyrood um, Public Sector Awards. But the work is not, uh, is not done, and as Carol Mochan said in her speech, spring booster vaccinations are, are, are available until the end of June, uh, as is the initial offer of COVID-19 vaccination once again, I would encourage those eligible who have yet to come forward to do so to maintain their level of protection against COVID-19 infection. It is also worth recognising the range of other vaccinations that are offered to us in Scotland throughout our lifetime by our wonderful NHS. It is important that people receive their immunisations at the right age to ensure maximum protection from first immunisation appointments scheduled at two months of age, continuing through the teenage years and throughout adulthood in pregnancy to protect both mothers and their babies. And I thank Fulton McGregor for his considered thoughts on this. Diseases can be particularly serious in young babies, and it is important to ensure that they are protected as early as possible to prevent them from contracting potentially dangerous illnesses such as measles, which can have a very serious consequences. Although we have not talked about these other vaccinations, uh, as much as we have with COVID-19 in the past few years, it's just an important that when you're called for your shingles or your pneumococcal or HPV vaccines, that you attend and get yourself protected. We're pleased to be applying our learning from the pandemic to these wider vaccination programmes to improve everyone's experience, no matter which health intervention you are accessing. And I thank Christine Graham for emphasising this. We are currently supporting the transition of operational responsibility for flu and COVID-19 vaccine programmes to Public Health Scotland, which will take place after spring. This will allow a public health-driven approach and build 
on our world-class vaccination service. Alongside this, we are working in collaboration with a range of partners, including the other three UK nations of the UK, to consolidate and improve all of our vaccination programmes with a focus on high uptake, good systems and reduction in health inequalities. Uh, a number of members touched on uh, long COVID and the Scottish Government does recognise the significant impact that long COVID can have on the health and well-being of those most severely affected across Scotland. And we are making available £3 million from our £10 million long COVID support fund over this financial year to support NHS boards to increase uh, the capacity of existing services um, supporting those with the condition. And we are considering the recommendations of the COVID Recovery Committee report. Minister in must conclude. I'm concluding. Uh, Presiding Officer, the COVID-19 vaccination programme in Scotland was a success story and quite literally saved tens of thousands of lives. I would urge, M urge MSPs across the Chamber to acknowledge that success achieved in partnership across this Parliament and across the country by uh, rejecting the opposition's amendments and by supporting the government's. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the debate on celebrating the success of the COVID-19 vaccination programme. It's now time to move on to the next item of business, which is an announcement by the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee on report on the Scottish Government's air quality improvement plan and wider air quality issues. And I call on Edward Mountain, convener of the committee, to make the announcement up to five minutes. Mr. Uh, Mountain. Thank you, presiding officer. And I'm pleased to be able to speak today as convener of the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee to share our assessment of the Scottish Government's air quality improvement plan. As a committee, we agreed that requesting an announcement was important because it sets a strong precedent that improvement plans should be looked at differently to a typical affirmative instrument. To give a bit of context, the plan is the first to be considered under the po new post-Brexit arrangements for environmental law in Scotland and follows an improvement report issued by Scotland's new environmental watchdog, Environmental Standards Scotland. The focus of ESS's investigation was how nitrogen dioxide levels were being managed by local authorities within the current system of local air quality management and how they were being monitored. Now, they recommended a number of steps that the Scottish Government should take to speed up the tackling of air quality at a local level. The improvement plan has looked to address ESS's recommendations through making guidance to councils and SEPA more robust. We are broadly satisfied that these actions represent a step forward and hope this provides local authorities with the clarity they need in undertaking their stewardship of air quality. But we do have a number of concerns. Firstly, if we expect local authorities to deliver the necessary improvements to air quality, then the Scottish Government must ensure they are funded accordingly. A lack of resources means councils may continue to struggle, which risks hindering the realisation of the improvement plan's aims. Councils also face unprecedented staffing challenges. Without enough planning or environmental health officers, the Scottish Government will not be able to achieve its own ambitions on air quality. Our report calls on the Scottish Government to set out how it will increase uptake of these professions. We are also not convinced updated policy guidance will ensure that SEPA delivers the desired approach to monitoring and enforcement of local air quality standards. We are also unclear whether the agency has the relevant powers and resources to undertake its additional oversight role to full effect. Presiding officer, the committee also choose to take this opportunity to consider wider air quality issues. And I would briefly like to set out a few of our key findings. Firstly, we assess the effectiveness of the Scottish Government's Cleaner Air for Scotland too. We found that whilst this strategy has ambition, there has been a lack of a progress in implementing some of the key promises to mainstream air quality across policy agendas and to deliver a modal shift towards sustainable forms of transport. We also looked at low emission zones. 
we found that LEZs were significant development in tackling air pollution in our urban spaces, but they were not a silver bullet on their own. Instead, a wider package of interventions must be looked at to combat air, air pollution, particularly in more rural areas where LEZs were unlikely to provide a solution. Finally, we looked at be best practice on tackling air quality. We were encouraged by the idea of establishing a programme of continuous improvement to make incremental progress towards achieving the challenging 2021 WHO guidelines. Our report calls on the Scottish Government to set out these pathways as part of their upcoming review of the Cleaner Air for Scotland too. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, the air that we breathe is absolutely essential to our well-being. By tackling air pollution, Scottish people can enjoy a better quality of life with reduced health risk. We hope the implementation of the Scottish Government's improvement plan will help achieve that aim. It's not perfect, but it is a step in the right direction. Therefore, Presiding Officer, we recommend that it is approved by the Scottish Parliament. Thank you. Thank you. It's now time to move on to the next item of business, and there are three questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first is that Amendment 8948.2, in the name of Sandesh Gulhani, which seeks to amend Motion 8948, in the name of Jenny Minto, on celebrating the success of the COVID-19 vaccination programme, be agreed. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we will move to a vote and there will be a short suspension to allow members to access the digital voting system.